Hi folks, welcome to your last video for Unit 1 in AP Government. Um, and we are going to wrap up this unit talking about uh, the debates between government power and individual rights that were sparked by the Federalists and Anti-Federalists. So up until this point, right, we've talked about kind of the history of our government through the Articles of Confederation, the Compromises, and we've even looked at the overview of the Constitution. Um, so this is where we're going to pick up today, talking about the Federalists and Anti-Federalists, and your learning objective that you will answer at the end of this video is explain how Federalist and Anti-Federalist views on central government and democracy are reflected in the U.S. foundational documents. Okay, that is going to be our main focus of this video. So, um, as I said, up until this point, we've talked about the Constitution. Great, we've written a Constitution. Let's sign the thing. However, the Federalists and Anti-Federalists say not so fast. Um, we are not ready to officially sign this thing yet. There are a couple of concerns, especially the Anti-Federalists say, that they have regarding this new Constitution. So two groups are going to emerge while the Constitution is being written and while the ratification process is happening. And those are the Federalists and Anti-Federalists. And really, um, if you don't remember anything about this from American history, these really are our two first uh, political parties, even. Um, you know, before there were Republicans and Democrats, there were the Feds and Anti-Feds. And what the Feds and Anti-Feds are going to debate is how much power the national or central government should have under this new constitution and what that exactly means for the citizens. So the anti-feds are really going to be the ones that put on the brakes like this guy here and say, not so fast. We really need to think about what this constitution is saying. So we're going to start with those anti-federalists um, and, and talk about their, their concerns. So the anti-federalists as a whole um, are your more rural members of the convention. They are going to oppose the new constitution as it is written. Let me be very clear. They do believe that something needs to change about the articles. However, as the constitution is written, they do not support ratifying it. What the anti-federalists want is more of a document based on states' rights to govern. So in the perfect world for the anti-feds, they would simply like a more revised uh, Articles of Confederation with the states retaining more power over the federal government while still giving the federal government some power that it was severely lacking under the Articles. Now, the Anti-Federalists are going to try uh, and uh, persuade uh, the states from not ratifying the Constitution, and they're going to emphasize the benefits of a smaller, decentralized republic, right, where power is concentrated more with the states. Um, because they felt as though that this central government created by the Constitution is far too strong. And really, their warning of a loss of liberty that can occur when you have a very large, centralized, and powerful central government. Okay? Now, to flesh that out a little bit, they were afraid of the national government restricting personal liberty and states' rights. They were very fearful of replicating that monarchical king, right? That tyranny that we faced. Um, and the reason for that was they feared that Congress, with its new ability to tax, its new ability to control a standing army, meaning even during peacetime, we have a military on our arsenal, and this necessary and proper clause. Those three things were very concerning to our anti-federalists who viewed this as a potential risk to the rights and liberties and states. 
Um, they feared that with the new federal uh, judicial system, that the Supreme Court would overrule the state courts and the states would simply become worthless when it came to governing and the people. So what the Anti-Federalists demanded was the Bill of Rights. They demanded a Bill of Rights, uh, at minimum, to limit the national government and the scope of its power when it came to the people and the states. Um, and we really see these arguments pop up in one of your founding documents, which is Brutus I. And uh, we are going to read Brutus I um, after we watch this video. So we will see all of these concerns pop up in this founding document that represents the anti-federalist view on central government and democracy. Now, in contrast, the Federalists are the ones that support the new Constitution. They support the strong central government. Um, they believe that the Constitution should be ratified as is. Um, they believe that the Constitution with this really strong central government was necessary to establish the unity that was missing under the Articles of Confederation, right? We got to do something. We can't have these states having all that power and creating chaos. And in response to the anti-federalists, they're going to write the Federalist Papers to really assure citizens and those ratifying the Constitution that they had created this federal system especially keeping in mind states importance. And really they're trying to emphasize that, look, this new constitution is not gonna diminish the importance of the states. They will have rights just like they did under the Articles of Confederation. We're simply fixing the problems that we faced under that document. Um, the Federalist Papers are also going to address that the inherent structure of the document um, like the Congress's power to tax, maintain a standing army, and the necessary and proper clause are not going to subject people to abuses by the new national government. These Federalist Papers are meant to uh, relie relieve some of those fears and anxieties that the Anti-Federalists felt. Um, and really they're saying, look, the structure of the Constitution is one where these new powers cannot happen like or they can happen but they're not going to infringe on the rights of the people and states as a result they feel like the bill of rights is not necessary uh, the structure of the document as we will see with separation of powers checks and balances federalism all of that is in place to prevent the federal government from infringing on rights so therefore we don't need a bill of rights in fact the Federalists were afraid of compiling a list of rights because when you write a list, right, aren't you kind of confined to that list? So there was some hesitation from the Federalists on the necessity uh, and exactly what should be included in the Bill of Rights itself. Um, so we are going to see uh, Madison in particular, James Madison, uh, write about these concerns and uh, features of the Constitution in another founding document, which is Federalist number 10, or sorry, Federalist number 51. So Fed 51 is really what's going to address the structure of the Constitution um, and talk about the, uh, the unnecessary nature of the Bill of Rights. Now, as you guys know, we do end up with a Bill of Rights. So this was, in a sense, a compromise between the Feds and Anti-Feds. Uh, the Feds got their Constitution, right? They wanted that document. They wanted with a stronger national government. The Anti-Feds got the Bill of Rights to ensure and, you know, alleviate some of their anxiety about this stronger national government. Um, and this was that crucial compromise to ratification. So what we see is the Bill of Rights contains the first 10 amendments to the Constitution. And it's written to restrict the national government and prevent its abuse on an individual's civil liberties. Um, so this, in effect, is an example of limited government, right? It's placing restrictions or it's putting the government in the last video we talked about on a leash um, to restrict where it can and cannot go in terms of its powers. Um, so again, review. Um, I just told you that it's an example of limited government, but on your notes, be sure to explain why.
that is an example. Um, and also think about how does this Bill of Rights represent the anti-federalist argument as well. Okay, so pause the video uh, and then resume when you have that on your notes. So uh, we are left with then the Bill of Rights, which was ratified in, or excuse me, 1791. Um, some key rights or amendments that we have, um, Article 1, or the First Amendment, is really going to be the First Amendment for a reason, right? This is the one that the Founding Fathers, the, especially the anti-feds, believed was most important. So you've got freedom of speech, religion, press, assembly, petition. Right, being able to speak out against the government um, and redress our grievances was really huge for our founding fathers, especially when you consider where you know our government came from with a king um, who did not allow us to do that. Uh, amendment two, the right to bear arms. Um, this amendment has changed vastly uh, in interpretation over the years, and we'll talk about this in a later unit. But right, the the right to own a firearm um, that is. Amendment number two. The Fourth Amendment, uh, the right to be free from unreasonable searches and seizures, right? The government cannot just walk into your house or the police cannot just walk into your house and take your stuff. They have to have what's called probable cause um, or a warrant to be able to justify those actions. So again, placing a limit or restriction on government action. Um, our uh, Amendment 5, 6, and 7 really deal with the legal process and something called due process. Um, everyone in the, in the country uh, is required to be treated equally and fairly under the law. That is due process. Whether that is a fair and speedy trial, the right to a lawyer, a trial by your peers, or uh, with a jury of your peers, excuse me, um, those are included in Amendments 5 through 7. Right. You are free from cruel and unusual punishment, according to Amendment 8. Right. You can't shoplift and then your bail be set at eight million dollars. Right. That's not fair. Um, it has to be comparable to the crime. Um, Article 9 or Amendment 9 is really what appeased the Federalists. Remember, I said the Federalists were kind of concerned about writing down these rights uh, because, you know, what happens if you write down these rights and then the government is all of a sudden able to say, well, guess what? It's not written in the Bill of Rights. We can take that away. Amendment 9 says that, well, people have rights that are not listed here in the document. That does not mean that the government can take them away. So that's kind of the flexibility of Amendment 9. It allows uh, the Bill of Rights to be a little bit more flexible in what is protected uh, for the people. And then you have Article 10 or Amendment 10. And the 10th Amendment is really what establishes federalism and protects the principle of federalism. So it says that powers not given to the national government or prohibited to the states are given to the states. So this is what outlines those reserved powers um, that we see when we talk about federalism. Um, we will take a look at the Bill of Rights, uh, especially when we get into civil rights and liberties, but it is important to know as an overview, right, these are important because this is proof to our government that we have these rights, you cannot take them away. So this is limited government. All right, so like I said, this concludes your videos for unit one. Um, make sure to answer this learning objective. So based on this video, you should be able to explain how Federalists and Anti-Federalists uh, and what their views were on the central government and democracy and how those are reflected in the US foundational documents. So think about the Constitution, think about Brutus, Fed 51, think about the Bill of Rights. You have options when it comes to explaining this objective. Okay, uh, pause the video, make sure you have everything written down. Uh, let me know if you guys have any questions and I look forward to seeing you guys in class and debriefing. See you later.